We're continuing our journey through the course analytics for business and economics with lecture number 12, um, the chi-squared goodness of fit test. And so this marks a, um, a, a segue in the course from primarily focusing on the tool that we're using, which is R and R Studio, to focusing on the statistics, which we're actually here to learn. So the first part of this course really was to make sure everyone had a crash course and that the, the tools didn't get too much in the way. Um, from now on, we're going to focus on the statistics using the tool to learn the statistics. So we're going to use R to learn about, in this case, how to do a goodness of fit test. And so thinking about that, what is a goodness of fit test? Well, the chi-squared test allows us to look at what we call categorical data. Categorical data is data that doesn't fit into a number, so it's not like there's one, two, three, four of them, or one is twice is you know half as much as two, and two is twice as much as one. That's that's numerical data. All right. Categorical data is where we're trying to put things into a category. Like for example, we might be trying to describe birdhouses, and we may have birdhouses that are red and birdhouses that are yellow. Okay, and those are two different categories of birdhouses. There's no sense in which, you know, a red birdhouse is twice as much as a yellow birdhouse. It's just a category. Okay, and so we use that in order to, um, uh, we'll use categorical data in order to represent that um, those types of, of problems that have data that have characteristics about observations that aren't necessarily numeric. All right, and so we'll, we'll use this, this first start is looking at using the chi-squared test to analyze um, categorical data. So we're gonna use the most basic form in this first lecture of the chi-squared test called the goodness of fit test. So without any further ado, let's dive in. So we'll begin our lecture on the good, chi-squared goodness of fit test. Notice the um, setup is exactly the same as we would normally do. I've got my R studio over here on the right hand side of my screen and I have my lecture notes over here on the left hand side of my screen and for a few minutes I'm just going to take and I'm going to squish down our studio a little bit and increase the size of my lecture notes because I want to talk a little bit about the statistics before we get started. So first thing we should do is we should talk a little more about what is the chi-squared goodness of fit test. Well we can see the chi-squared goodness of fit test is a statistical test. Hey that's 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 insightful right you know talking about statistics and statistical tests well it is to determine how well an observed categorical data all right so some categorical data that we observe so we think we have 10 yellow we observe 10 yellow um, birdhouses and 10 red birdhouses you know, something like that i don't know it doesn't matter we want to see does that match what we would expect or the distribution that we would expect. For example, let's say we want to measure, um, you know, 10% of all the birdhouses in town A are um, red. How many, are, will they be 10% in town B and 10% in town C, right? All right, will it have the same distribution over colors? Um, or will it not, all right? It depends on what we expect. And that's just a really silly example. Um, we'll come up with better ones as we go. But what we want to do is we want to know does this categorical data that we observe match what we expect? And this is so much the story of what goes on in statistics. All right, we start out with a hypothesis. All right, I'm going to call that the null hypothesis, and we'll talk about that in just a second. We start out with this null hypothesis. This is what we expect to be true. Then we observe some data. We take a sample. All right, not all of the data because we can't observe everything. We can only observe this part that we can we can see that's called our sample. And we want to use that evidence that we find from the sample to determine whether or not that null hypothesis is is believable or not. In other words, and not really whether the null hypothesis is believable, but whether or not we should change that null hypothesis in light of the data that we see. In other words, what we want to do is we want to know how far away is what we observe from what we expect to observe. And if what we observe is far enough away from what we expect, then at some point we have to think about changing our expectations. So let's keep plugging around. Um, this test is really useful in situations where we have categorical data. All right. 
think about this, you know, I, um, I look at something like, I don't know, um, I'm rolling a dice, all right? So we're playing a game, and your friend comes over, and he brings his own dice, all right? And I mean, I don't know, it's Risk, or it's um, Dungeon and Drag, whatever it is, some weird game where you roll dice, and he's rolling dice, and man, he's on fire. He's just winning every single roll. Question. Is he cheating? I mean, you know, you see him winning so much, you're wondering, well, we could use a chi-squared test to figure that out, right? Because if you think about it, let's say I have a six-sided dice, all right? So just a cube, just a normal normal, set, uh, normal die, all right? One of them. Dice is plural, die is one. So we just have one. It has six sides. It goes from one to six. Every time I roll, I'm going to one, two, three, four, five, or six. If it's a fair die, what should I get? I should get about the same number of ones as twos, as threes, as fours, as fives, and sixes, right? It should be evenly or uniformly distributed over the different categories of roles. Okay, easy peasy. So what we want to do is we just keep track of every role, and then we find out, well, how many ones, twos, threes, fours, fives, six, and we want to test, they should all be pretty close to equal. Now, if we're just taking a sample, we know they won't be exactly equal, but are they close enough? And that's exactly what we're going to try to do with this chi-squared goodness of fit test. So let's dig in with a little more specificity. All right, so let's talk about the setup of the chi-squared goodness of fit test. And the first thing we have to talk about is our hypotheses. So whenever we do um, um, any kind of experiment and we're working with data, there's a number of things we have to avoid. Um, one of these on here is I have a nice little video here. It's kind of fun. It's from Ted Ed. Um, it's animated. It's really cool. It's on p-hacking. All right. And one of the things that they suggest in this video to avoid this really bad thing of p-hacking, and watch the video if you want to, is, you know, define your experiment ahead of time. This is what we're going to do um, before you actually do your, your experiment. Right? And this is really good practice. So what we're going to do is the first thing in any hypothesis or any statistical test, we need to define, okay, what is our hypotheses? All right, and we're going to have two. The first one is the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis, as you know from um, hypothesis testing, is the default. It's what we give the benefit of the doubt to. So in this case, for the chi-squared, it's going to be the observed data fits the expected distribution. Okay, that's, that's it, all right? We expect a certain distribution uh, amongst the categories, you know, in, in, in our case of, of rolling the dice, we expect one-sixth of the time it to be one, or 16 and two-thirds percent of the time, it will be one, and so on and so forth for two, three, four, five, and six. Now, if we roll the dice 100 times and we get 50% of the time it comes up one, um, and... The other 50% of the time it comes up six, something's wrong, right? That doesn't fit that dis that normal distribution, or that, not normal, but the distribution that we think it should, that uniform distribution that we think it should have, correct? And so our null hypothesis is the data fits the distribution. We get a roughly equal number of each types of role. The alternative is, of course, oh no, I've got this. I've got a I've got a typo. Oh no, another one. The observed data does not should go right in there. It should say does not right in there. I'll fix that later. Um, but it should do, it does not fit the expected distribution. Simple enough, right? So it's either the null or the alternative, All right? And they're kind of um, basically complementary to one another. Well, that's 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 on purpose. All right, so let's go next. The next thing we need to determine is what is our level of significance. All right, so our level of significance, or or another way of thinking about this, what is the confidence level? All right, and and so those two those two concepts go hand in hand with one another. Um, the level of significance is equal to one minus the confidence level. So, you know, sometimes I will go back and forth with them, um, or even sometimes I'll accidentally say one meaning the other. Uh, because they're just so interchangeable for me. But the confidence level, that's the probability of correctly failing to reject the null hypothesis. In other words, if we have a 95% confidence level, that means if we rejected the null hypothesis, 
you know, um, it, you know, we gave it a really big benefit of the doubt. All right, we can be not essentially at least 95% certain of our results. All right, that's what comes, and we talk a lot more about that in the previous course, not previous lecture, but previous course on this, where we talk about in 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 depth detail hypothesis testing. I'm assuming you have some knowledge of hypothesis testing to start with. Okay, well, the alpha level is kind of the reverse of that. It's just one minus that confidence level. Okay, and something we should always do is we should always choose an appropriate alpha level prior to conducting our tests. All right, this is just good practice. All right, you know, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's part of avoiding p-hacking. It's not all of avoiding p-hacking. And if you want to know what that p-hacking is, watch this video. Um, but it certainly is very good practice. We need to know what we're talking about prior to um, making our decision. Oftentimes, we'll use an alpha level of 0 0.05, okay? Um, and so if, as long as we're 95% certain of our results, we have a confidence level of 95% that equates to an alpha level of 0 0.05, then um, we consider that to be what's called statistically significant, okay? Or we're willing to reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis. Okay, and so let's keep going, put a pin in that because we'll come back to all of this stuff and make it a little easier when we're talking about the evaluation of results like right down here. But for right now, let's talk about the basic mechanics of the chi-squared goodness of fit test. All right, so the first thing we need to do is we need to calculate a test statistic. And so what this test statistic essentially does is we're trying to measure how closely our data is, our observed data is, to our expected distribution. So we have a distribution, all right, or of how much is in each category that we observe. How close is that to what we expect to see, right? So if it's distributed the way we think it is, here's what that's what we would expect to see, the number we'd expect to see in each category. That's what this expected is. Oh, I see another typo, I'm so sorry. That I right there that I just highlighted, that should be a subscript. So, oh well. Um, versus observed. How many do we actually observe in each category? So what we're going to do is let's take our dice example for a second. I'm going to throw the dice, uh, you know, um, ten. Uh, I don't know, hundred times. Okay, I'm going to have a hard time remembering all of these, but I'm only going to do the first couple. All right. So I count them up and I get. Um, um, 20 times, I see a one. Well, if I roll it 100 times, I'd expect to see somewhere between 16 and 17 times if it's distributed, if it comes out perfectly with respect to the expected distribution, but I see 20. So I would take 20 minus the expected value, which is 16 or 17, so about 16 and two thirds, but we'll, we'll, we'll round it up to 17 for right the second. Um, and that distance tells me how far away I am from what I expected, at least for that one category. Then I square that, and I square that because sometimes I might be high, sometimes I might be low. If it's just random variation that's causing, and I'll be high as much as I am low. And so the, those differences or that distance will turn out to be zero on average. So we need to get rid of the sign. Basically, when I talk about distance, I care about how far, not which direction. So if I think about a number, and I think about this difference between observed and expected, it has two parts. It has the actual magnitude, or the distance, the number, and then it has the sign on it, right? whether it's negative or positive. So if observed is less than expected, it's going to have a negative sign, right? And so the distance would be in the negative direction. Well, for the chi-squared test statistic, I don't care about that direction. I want to get rid of that direction, actually. And so I do that by squaring it. Then I have one more problem, okay? Maybe I only roll the dice 100 times. Maybe I roll the dice 10,000 times, all right? If I roll the dice 100 times, I'm gonna get one number. If I hold the dice 10,000 times, I might get a much bigger number. And so I have to deal with scale. And so I deal with scale by dividing that whole distance by the expected number of observations in each category, okay? And so I'll do that for each category then I'm going to add them up, and that gives me 
my chi-squared test statistic. All right, if that doesn't make sense yet, don't worry. We're going to do it in R, and I'm going to show you again, and hopefully it'll make sense there. So we'll show it two different ways. But let's keep plunging away for right now. The next thing we have to do is figure out our degrees of freedom. And one of the things I find that's most helpful in understanding the idea of degrees of freedom and calculating the degrees of freedom is to actually know what the word degrees of freedom really means. What do we mean by that? Well, when we talk about degrees of freedom, we think about it in terms of way a system, in this case, you know, our observations and our chi-square tests and everything can wiggle. What the heck does that mean? Well, to understand that, I'm going to abstract away and use a really simple of example of an average. All right, so we're going to take a take a little bit of a parentheses right here um, and talk about um, average. So just a simple mean. Let's say you have taken four quizzes, okay, and your overall average for those four quizzes is 75%. Okay. If I tell, can, can you tell me what scores you got on the four quizzes? Well, the answer is no, I don't have enough information. I know they averaged to 75, but there's lots of different ways four quizzes could average to 75, right? So I have too many degrees of freedom to figure out what they all are. So let me, let me, let me remove one of those degrees of freedom. Let me, let me narrow it in and I'm going to tell you that on the first quiz, you got 100%. All right, can you tell me what scores you got on the second, third, and fourth quiz? The answer is no, no, I can't do that because I still, there's lots of different ways those th second, third, and fourth quizzes could be to still end up having 100% or a 75% average, even though I know I have 100% um, on the first quiz. Okay, not enough information, fine. I'll, I'll help you out again. I'll tell you on the second quiz, you got 100%. Say, okay, I know the Quiz number one, 100%. Quiz number two, 100%. Can you tell me what you got on quiz three and four? The answer is still no. There's multiple ways. There's multiple solutions to that thing. There's multiple ways that the scores that I could get on question quizzes three and four that would add up, to, that would give me an average of 75%. Finally, I'm going to tell you, you got a score of 50% on the third quiz. Can you tell me what the four, what score you got on the fourth quiz? In that case, yes, you can, right? Because I know the score on the first quiz, the second quiz, and the third quiz, and I know the average. If I put all that information together, I can solve for the fact that I got a 50% on the fourth quiz. So I got 100, 100, 50, and 50, all right? The first three quizzes there, and it doesn't matter which ones they are, the first three that I tell you are free to be anything they want. But once I tell you three scores out of the four, I know what the fourth one is. So your number of degrees of freedom are generally going to be your number of observations minus the number of parameters you estimate. All right. In this case, we only average the only parameter we estimated was the mean. And so we know the mean four minus one parameter is three degrees of freedom. With um, uh, when, when it comes to uh, the chi-squared test, okay, we can do the same thing. Only our observations is our number of categories, and our parameter is the chi-squared test statistic. And so for the goodness of fit test, the number of degrees of freedom is going to be the number of categories, K, minus the number of parameters, which in this case is equal to 1, so it's going to be k minus 1. So in the case of our dice, we had six categories, so six different types of roles or outcomes. We have one parameter, so you'd have five degrees of freedom. Okay, so finally, once we have all of that, and, and we need to know the degrees of freedom because this chi-squared test statistic has a chi-squared distribution. That's why it's called a chi-squared test statistic because it has a chi-squared distribution. And we'll look at that here. Here's an example of a chi-squared um, distribution, what it might look like. And this is one that happens to have five degrees of freedom. Um, it's almost like I planned it that way. Um, I promise I didn't, but it's almost like I did. In any event, uh, all right, it has that chi-squared test dis or distribution. 
and we define a chi-squared distribution by its number of degrees of freedom. In this case, um, the chi-squared distribution changes based on the number of degrees of freedom. So here we have five, that's lovely, and boom. So evaluating our results, we come down here and we can look at this distribution and we see we have a couple things. First of all, I have a dotted line here at what's called a critical value. Critical value is a value if that test statistic is beyond this critical value or bigger than this critical value, what do we do? We will reject the null hypothesis, which means this red area here under the curve, that's the area um, uh, corresponding to the alpha or 0.05 or 5% probability. So if our test statistic lies anywhere in this, what we call the rejection region, we will reject the null hypothesis in favor of the um, null hypothesis. Or if you wanna make it really, really super simple, if the p-value is small, you reject the null. But wait a minute, I didn't tell you what a p-value was. Well, if I figure out what the probability to the left, or I'm sorry, to the right of my actual test statistics, so this is my critical value, not the test statistic, but the critical value. My test statistic, if it's say over here, let's say my test statistic is, my chi-squared test statistic is 15. I could find what is the probability of getting a chi-squared test statistic of 15 or higher? That would be my p-value. And if my p-value is below 0 0.05, in this case, because I chose an alpha 0 0.05, I reject the null. Because if it's below 0 0.05, I know I'll be in this rejection region. Okay, that was a lot. All right, let's do an actual example um, and put all this stuff into practice. Hopefully that'll make it, make it work a little bit better and make you understand a little bit better. So I'm gonna squish up my, um, I'm gonna squish up my notes here and make R a little bit bigger. And you can see I've already started some stuff. So, oh, we don't want that. Let's don't cheat. Let's get in there. I am gonna cheat and leave my observe. So I've got some examples here. So first of all, we're gonna do this from scratch. I know it's a little bit hard to see my um, notes entirely, but that's a little better. Okay, so let's look at this. Um, and I'm gonna give you a couple caveats, a couple things I've found that are important. Let me go ahead, I'm gonna squeeze up my console because I don't need that. I've just loaded up a, a markdown file that I'm gonna use for some notes. And I'm gonna run here. This is my observed and my expected, hooray. And so what I'm gonna do is I have this data in. So this is observed. This is the data that I actually observed, right? But I'd also, I expect this distribution. All right, so out of the data that I observed, I would expect it to have 15, 15, and 30. What I actually got was 10, 20, and 30. Here's my question. Am I close enough with the data I observed? Or is this so far away from what I expect, I need to think about updating my expectations. I need to reject the null hypothesis in favor of an alternative, which is, no, it's not distributed as I expected. All right, so let's get started. I'm gonna make code chunk. So I just click on this little C button up here, click on R and that gives me a nice little code chunk. You could also type this in manually. There's nothing special about it. It's kind of nice. And then what we're gonna do is the first thing, first step is I wanna calculate my chi-squared test statistic. So I'm gonna do that in a couple of steps um, and show it to you what's kind of going on. So first of all, I don't wanna type that because I'm lazy, so I copied that. There's my assignment operator. Now let's do the rest of it. The first thing I wanna do is I wanna get this distance observed minus expected. I wanna know how close I am. Okay, the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and take a, a quick extra step and, no, wrong button. All right, and, and retype out this variable name so that it'll print out the results. So let's just see what happens when I do observed minus expected. Run that, boom, I get negative five, five and zero. Okay, so if I added that up, what would it be? It'd add up to zero. Okay, so I don't want that. I wanna know what the distance is. And so part of it is that negative tells me direction. I don't need to know the direction right now. I want them all to be positive. So what I'm gonna do is, 
I'm going to highlight that whole thing and hit open parenthesis. And instead of you know deleting it and just putting in a parenthesis there, R Studio just encapsulates that whole thing in parentheses. You could do that. If you don't want to do it, you don't have to. I just find it really easy. Um, it'll bug you until you get used to it, and then you'll like it. All right, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to square this. Okay, so let's run that. Easy peasy. Now I got 25, 25, and 0. Notice when I add that up, that's going to add to 50. It's not going to add um, to 0. And so I've got a sense of direction. Or I'm not, not direction, of, 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 of distance. All right, you know, you can kind of think of it as the distance squared-ish kind of thing. Um, but, you know, why do we use squared instead of absolute value? Because squares are a whole lot easier to use than absolute values and, and whatnot. So, but basically... That's what we do. Then finally, I don't know what this 50 means. So I want to divide that by my expected values. All right, if I divide that by my expected values, I'll scale that based on you know how big the numbers are. You know, if I added a zero to each one of these, for example, let me show you. I'm just going to add a, add, add a zero. So I'm going to tie multiply that by 100 and so what I'll end up is 10 0 0 actually just 10 that'll add one zero to it and then I'm going to multiply this by 10 and that'll add one zero to each one of them so let me let me do that and then I'll show you what happened all right 100 to it yeah it just added one zero in there right now let me go through and just do what's here all right now it's 2500 2500 and zero so it's now 5000 is what it sums up to rather than 50 doesn't matter it's still still the same it's just been scaled up a little bit so what we need to do is we need to eliminate that problem of scale by dividing by the the expected values and notice what it's doing it's just doing it element by element so it takes the first one minus the second one to get the the minus five the second one minus the second one to get the plus five the third one minus the third one to get the zero. And then it squares each one of those. And now we're just going to divide that result by the first one they expect and so on and so forth. And so if I run this, boom, I get that. All right, so 16.66, 16.66, and zero. What happens if I multiply this by 10? Again, I'll put this back in. Run that. I get the same result. That's why we do that. That's why we divide it by the expected, um, the expected amounts. Okay. So there we go. Bing. But the chi-squared test statistic. I want a number. I want one number, not three. So I have to get rid of these three. So what am I going to do? I'm going to take the sum S U M and sum those up. And I need an open parenthesis. And it's going to yell at me here in a second. Maybe. Come on. Let me click away. It didn't. Oh, well, it should have because I need a close parenthesis there. All right, and I'm going to run this. And ping, there's my, there's my test statistic. And notice if I multiply these by 1,000 or, okay, 100 because I can't control how many times I hit the zero button. Run that. Run that. I still get the same. Well, I get a different number, don't I? But um, that would also change things. So we're going to leave it be. Oh, no, I get the same number. Why am I getting that number? Oops, here we go. There we are. That's the number we want. Okay, so far, so good. Okay, let's keep going. So now we get this. This is our, our, this is our chi-squared test statistic. Now, what we want to do is we want to find the p-value. Okay, so we want this p-value. But before we do that, we got to figure out how it's distributed. So we need to know what the degrees of freedom are. So let's find those degrees of freedom. And I know it's simple. There are three categories, right? Whatever these categories are, I don't remember what they are, but there's one, two, three. There's 10 in the first category, 20 in the second category, 30 in the third category is what we observe. But three categories, so K is three. We have one chi-squared test statistic, so three minus one is two. But let's let's make the computer do that for us 
you know, that way, you know, if someday we decided to add an extra category in here, it'd still be, it'd still be okay. So we're going to use the length function. So length is going to tell us how many elements are in the observed vector. There we go. Okay, and then let's let's display that. So there's three elements in that observed vector, and so now we need to subtract one parameter, one chi-squared statistic, and Bing, we have two degrees of freedom. Exactly what we expected. Final thing we want to do is the p-value. So let's let's hold on just a second and let's look at what this p-value will be. And I know I've got the, the number right here. Um, ignore that for a second. What we're going to do is we need to take this chi-square distribution. And this looks a little weird, all right, because it's only giving you like part of it. Well, that's just because um, the chi this is a lot of what the chi-squared test statistic lo or distribution looks like when we have a very few number degrees of freedom. In this case, we only have two, so it does look a little bit weird. But don't worry about that too much. I promise this is a chi-squared um, distribution with two degrees of freedom. And what we want to do is we're going to say, OK, what is our test statistic? Well, our test statistic is 3.3, and so that's right about where this dotted line is. OK. What's the probability of getting 3.3 or bigger? So it's this area that I'm wiggling on my mouse all around to the right, uh, under, the, under the curve, to the right of my test statistic. Right? That's what my p-value is. That's what I want to find. So let's do that really quickly. All right, so I'm going to get myself a new thing. I'll call this p-value. OK. And then what we're going to do is we're going to use a function. We're going to use the p function. p stands for probability. Right? There's two really important functions that we need to remember. There's the p function and the q function. All right? Actually, there's several p functions and several q functions, but don't worry about that for right this second. The p function takes as an argument the quantity, in this case, our chi-squared test statistic, and gives you the probability um, associated with either being bigger than or less than that um, that quantity. Okay, and then the next part of the p function is the distribution. So there's a p norm, there's a p t for a t distribution, there's even a p chi square for the chi square distribution. So we're going to type p for probability, and then c h i s q for this chi square distribution. All right, and then we're going to go ahead and we're going to say Q, that's our quantity. That'll be our test statistic. Okay, paste. Then we're going to have, we need our degrees of freedom because that defines the chi-squared test statistic. Now this is going to look really weird because I call this DF and the function argument is DF. So I'm going to have DF equals DF. It's terrible programming, but it works in R, so hey, we're going to go with it. And then finally, we need to do something called hit the tab button inside the function, and it gives you a list of all the possible arguments. We need to set the lower tail. Okay. Now, here's something I learned today, believe it or not. There is an equivalency of I could type F. Don't do that. That can screw things up. Uh, type F-A-L-S-E. For false or capital T R U E for true. And what does this say? Okay, if I'm gonna come down here, I'm gonna look at my I'm gonna look at my distribution. Maybe I'll come up here to this one. It looks a little prettier. And say I'm at this this point here, this is my critical value, right? I can go lower tail, which is to the left, this way, or I can go upper tail, which is to the right. Well, if I say lower tail equals true, it gives me this side. If I say lower tail equals false, it gives me this side. And so I want lower tail equal false, so it gives me the right-hand side or what we call the upper tail. Upper because I guess we think to the right is bigger and bigger is up, so uh, there you go, the upper tail. All right, and so we need to set lower tail equal to false. We're always gonna set lower tail equal to false when we do a chi-squared test. All right, P underscore value. Um, to print that out, and let's put this, and we get 
0 0.18, which if we look at our results, boom, hey, we're getting the right thing. Awesome sauce. And if you want to, you can put this right here. This just gives, all that does is take your output and make it a little more pete. There you go. All right, so let's keep going. The next thing we need to do is we need to evaluate this result. What does this mean? Our chi-squared test statistic is that, and then we can come in here and we can get our p-value. We'll run that. And our p-value is that big monster. All right, 18. So how do we how do we evaluate this? So the easiest way I think is just to draw a graph. So I have a graph here, it's drawn out for you. And you can see I have my chi-square distribution drawn in. Here the dashed line is where my test statistic shows up. It's about 3.3, so that's right there about 3.3. Now I don't have the critical value done in, drawn in, but I do have the red rejection region. And you can see our p-value is 0 0.189. Well, that's bigger than our alpha of 0 0.05. So we fail to reject the null hypothesis. We have insufficient evidence to conclude that the observed data is distributed differently than expected. Now, there's a real important nuance there. We have not concluded the data is distributed as, as expected. All right, that wasn't what we were trying to prove. We were trying to show that it was not distributed as expected, and we failed to do that, All right? So this, if you go way back to thinking about hypothesis testing, it's just like when we have a criminal trial and we have the presumption of, uh, of innocence, all right? If someone is acquitted at a trial, it doesn't mean they're found innocent. What it means is the prosecution failed to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant was guilty. Okay, because the it, it goes to burden of proof. The 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 um, accused or the defendant does not have the burden of proof. The prosecution has the burden of proof. They have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the person is guilty. Here. We don't have to prove that the null hypothesis is true. The burden of proof is to prove that the alternative hypothesis is the correct one, okay? And in this case, there was insufficient evidence for us to make that conclusion, okay? And if you need to review that, um, schedule a meeting with me. The, the ideas of hypothesis testing are really covered in the previous, um, in, the, in the class that's prerequisite to this one. Um, but if you meet with me, I'll be happy to go into that in a little more detail. All right, so let's finally, let's do an example of the chi-squared goodness of fit test, but let's just use the, the, you know, the R function to do that. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to, let's put our, let's save this in something called test results. Okay, and then what we're going to do is we're going to use the, the chi-squared, C-H, I S Q dot test. No, C H I S Q dot test. Okay, and we need to give it first of all our observed data, and then we need to give it something specific because the chi squared um, test function, chi squared dot test, doesn't want the number of of things in each category. It wants the proportion in each category or that distribution. And so we're going to use this real quick and let's let's just find out what that does. I'm going to copy this real quick. I'm going to come down here and take a quick detour and show you this. So if I come right down here and I say okay this is going to give you expected divided by the sum of expected. So it's going to sum this up. All right, sum of expected is going to be what? 15 plus 15 plus 30, so that's 60. And so the first one is going to be 10 divided by 60. Or I'm sorry, it's going to be 15 divided by 60. Uh, and then 15 divided by 60. And then 30 divided by 60. Or 
it'll give me 0 0.25, 0 0.25, and 0.5. All right, so let's let's see that real quick. All right, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, and 0.5, and that's what it's looking for. So let me go ahead. I'm gonna um, cut that, and I'm gonna put that right here because it's looking for P for proportions, right? And then I'm going to print my test results. I don't need to use the print function there. I can just type test results. Run that, and boom. I get chi-squared test statistic for given probabilities. Chi-squared of 3.333. Yay, got the right answer. Degrees of freedom, 2. And my p-value is 0.1. And so, yes, I did all of this work. Could easily be done in one, maybe two lines of code, uh, which is really cool, but it's also really important to understand what's going on under the hood. All right, and with that, I will leave you with just a couple more points. The chi-squared goodness of fit test um, gives a chi-squared test statistic and a p-value, all right? Um, a large chi-squared statistic or, and, or, and, um, a small p-value, if we have a large statistic, we will have a small p-value, indicate the observed data deviates from the expected um, distribution. All right. If the p-value is small, we reject the null. If the p-value is less than your chosen significance level, oftentimes 0 0.05, um, but not necessarily, uh, you reject the null hypothesis that the observed data follow the expected distribution. And with that, we will see you in the next lecture.